On behalf of the Bloomington Bach Cantata Project, welcome to the Bloomington Early Music Festival. I'm Dan Malamed, director of the Cantata Project. We present Bach's cantatas and performances modeled on his own. Today's work is a little different for us. It's not a liturgical cantata, but one Bach composed in honor of the Saxon queen and electress. And its performance under Bach was not in a church, but almost certainly took place in a coffee house. It's populated by four female Greek and Roman mythological characters and is unrelenting in its praise and rejoicing in honor of the queen. Our routine is to hear a performance of the cantata, a short talk about it, and then a second performance in which we hope you will hear new and different things.
ist der Tag, wo jede sich erfreuen mag. Dies ist der frohe Glanz der Königin Geburtsverstunde, die Polen, Sachsen und uns ganz größte Lust und Glück erfuhren. Mein Ölbaum kriegt so saft als fetten Raum. Er zeigt noch keine falbe Blätter. Mich schreckt kein Sturm, Blitz, trübe Wolken. Ist es Wetter?
und preisgetrennte Wahl. Königin mit deinem Namen, fühl ich in diesem Kreis der Welt, diesem Kreis der Welt, Krumm und preisgetrennte Namen, Königin mit deinem Namen, Gekrönt in deinem Namen fühl ich diesen Kreis der Welt. Krönt uns Kreis, gekrönt Herren, Königin mit deinem Namen fühl ich diesen diesen Kreis der Welt. Fühl ich diesen Kreis der Welt. Schön gestirnten Himmels wachsen, der Königin der Sachsen und der Polen sei stets des Himmelschutz empfohlen, so stärkt durch sie der Pol, so viele Untertanen längst der Wüste. 
If you know some cantatas by Johann Sebastian Bach, they are probably mostly liturgical works, church pieces. But we also have about 20 cantatas that Bach composed for other purposes. Now they tend to be lumped together today as secular cantatas, but that's a problematic term because it covers everything from satirical coffeehouse skits in dialect to ceremonial works for royalty. Now as it happens, our work tonight is somewhere in between. It's a coffee house piece in honor of royalty, and that shows just how difficult it is to generalize about these so-called secular cantatas. These pieces have familiar kinds of movements, recitatives and poetic arias, both solo and choral arias, but I would say that the background underlying these works is at least as obscure now as the theological basis of the church pieces is today. So the background here is political. Leipzig was part of the central German realm of Saxony, whose seat was in Dresden. The ruler was the elector, meaning he was one of those charged with choosing the Holy Roman Emperor. Dresden owed allegiance in turn to Vienna, the seat of the empire. Dresden was also a royal household because the Saxon electors were kings of Poland, and that was a result of military conquests in the late 17th and early 18th centuries. This meant that the Dresden court was bi-confessional. It was a Lutheran city, but its electors converted to Catholicism to take the Polish crown. Now, when Bach moved to Leipzig in 1723, the Saxon elector was Friedrich August I, and he reigned as King of Poland as August II. His wife was the electress Christiana Eberhardina, admired throughout Saxony for remaining Lutheran. In fact, she rejected her role as Queen of Poland, and when she died in 1727, Bach composed the Ode of Mourning, BWV 198, for a Leipzig memorial service in her honor. Friedrich August himself died in February 1733 and was succeeded by his son, Friedrich August II, 
who also took the Polish throne as August III. His wife was Maria Josefa Habsburg, daughter of the Emperor Joseph I, of course, a Catholic by birth. She embraced being Queen of Poland and spent a lot of time there. Friedrich August II was thus the reigning elector and king, and Maria Josefa, the electress and queen, in July 1733, when Bach visited Dresden and petitioned the court for an appointment. He left a composition as part of his application, the Kyria and Gloria setting best known today from their reuse in the Mass in B minor. An appointment did not come through until 1736, so it might be no accident that during this period between 1733 and 1736, many works by Johann Sebastian Bach survive in honor of the Saxon royal household. At least one was performed during a visit of the family to Leipzig, but they were mostly performed in Leipzig without the presence of royalty, documented in a printed text that was then sent to Dresden. All this is the context for Tönet ihr Pauken el Charlotte Trompeten Bidel 214. It was heard on December 8, 1733, for the birthday of the electress, Maria Josefa. It was performed under Bach's direction by the Collegium Musicum, that was a mixed amateur professional ensemble that had been founded by Georg Philipp Telemann during his student years in Leipzig. And the work was almost certainly performed at the fashionable Zimmermann's Coffee House. That was the regular cold weather home of the Collegium Musicum. In warm months, they performed outdoors at Zimmermann's Coffee Garden, held just outside the city walls. The work is typical in being a so-called drama per musica, with named speaking characters, they're usually mythological or allegorical. But BWV 214 is singular among Bach's homage cantatas in being for a female ruler, and in her honor in having four female characters. Irene, the Greek goddess of peace, Bellona, the Roman goddess of war, Pallas Athena, here as Greek patron of the muses, and Fama, the Greek personification of fame and renown. Now, it was possible for women to participate in music at making at Zimmermann's, and that was probably the case for a piece like Bach's well-known coffee cantata, Schlendrian and his daughter. In our work, all four characters are female. Three, though, were certainly sung by male performers, the bass, tenor, and alto roles. But we do not know who sang soprano. Now, in presenting this sort of work, Bach appears to have used many elements of his regular church music performing apparatus. So it would not be surprising if he used his usual, that is, all-male performers for this work, including for the soprano role. That presents a really interesting problem in trying to appreciate 18th century perspectives of gender and its musical representation from this work and a modern performance especially from trying to figure it out in modern performance. Consider the role of Bellona, the war goddess, here in our performance sung by a female soprano, but that woman is taking the role likely sung under Bach by a male singer. That male singer was portraying a female character, and that female character was typically portrayed and depicted in men's clothing. That's a lot to sort out. Political context is everywhere in the libretto of this work. First, in references to Saxony and Poland, and especially to Saxony and Poland together, because that combination was clearly felt to be in need of reinforcing, because the legitimacy of Saxon rule of Poland was in constant dispute. That's why we hear about Poland and Saxony together in two of the recitatives, and the second of them even makes a pun on the word Pole. Also prominent throughout is a military theme, we have a war goddess, a peace goddess. We have trumpets and drums, including the work's opening. We have the intense military imagery of Bellona's aria and recitative. And that's important because a great deal of Friedrich August's reputation was tied up in military conquest. And although this piece is dedicated to the queen and electress, it was important to flatter Friedrich August as well. Flattery and praise are all throughout. Now, that's to be expected in this society, in this context. But a striking feature is that many quoted words of praise are heard, things understood as spoken aloud when they're sung. Long live the queen, three times in the first movement. Crown and praise of crowned ladies in the seventh. 
and long live the queen again in the last. And these statements are distinguished in the original printed libretto by their typography, clearly meant to be understood as quoted text. And that puts a clear emphasis in this piece on sounding praise. The sound of praise is reflected in another way in this work. There are many references to musical sounds. The first movement is addressed to drums, to trumpets, to strings, and to voices, and it has the famous solo timpani opening. Bologna's aria is in, addressed in part to flutes, and we might note that the instrument cited by the war goddess is the flute. Now that can be difficult for modern listeners to make sense of, but in the 18th century, the flute was strongly gendered male. 18th century images of flutists are essentially always of men. The um, instrument was favored, in fact, especially by military men and associated with them. Think of Frederick the Great of Prussia, whom Bach also knew. That's why he could have a reputation both as a warrior and a flutist. And Bach's writing for the flute in Bologna's aria does invoke military sounds, paradoxically by imitating trumpets. Flutes can be pastoral, or they can be associated with sleep, or have other 18th century meanings. But here they clearly carry their military significance, and that's worth listening for. For Bologna, everything is musical even canons, and she is not even the arts patron in this work. That's Pallas Athena, a war goddess, but included here as patrons of the muses of Parnassus, here in honor of the queen, who is herself cited in number six as the protector of the muses. Number one calls for the singing of songs by blithe poets, and the aria number five calls for new songs, songs by, sung by the muses who are to cast down their quills, the emblems of their creativity. Pallas Athena's aria calls on the muses for a new joyous song. It then fulfills its own call with extravagant vocal and instrumental lines as emblems of joy. The last of the aria recitative pairs by Fama, the Greek personification of fame and renown, is sung by the character responsible for spreading news around the world. Here, that news is, of course, the praise of the queen. And this begs for a musical setting involving a trumpet. Trumpets are emblems of royalty, of course, and the royalty element is represented here by a quotation of a familiar horn and trumpet call. But the trumpet is also Fama's own instrument. She's typically depicted standing atop a globe playing the trumpet. One thing that distinguishes a work like this is that its libretto, its text, is all poetry. It alternates text designed to be set as arias and recitatives. This is in contrast to church works, which often additionally use hymn stanzas and scriptural text along with the poetry. There are aria recitative pairs for each of the four characters, no aria for Irene, who starts just with a recit. And this is a character characteristic division of labor. It has symbolic musical value, all the voices are used together in the opening choral aria, and then each is used individually, showing the listener what makes up the ensemble, and then all those voices are brought together again for the final chorus. The same for the instruments. Opens with a tutti movement, that is for everyone, and closes with a tutti movement. These two frame the work. In between, we have arias that present the flutes, an oboe, and strings together and trumpet. And that's the whole complement less the additional two trumpets and drums in the outer movements. The all poetic construction means that the opening and closing numbers are poetic too. They are aria tutti, they are choral arias, an aria for chorus. Chorus here is an ensemble that consists of the four named characters singing together, not a separate choir of other singers. And Bach's performing materials for this work and others like it make this clear. And so too do the individual statements by the four characters that open the final choral aria. The framing choral arias are characteristic of Bach's non-liturgical cantatas. At their core is the use of all four voices at once, declaiming the text together in clearly audible poetic meter. Turnet il pauken el schallet trompeten, klingen de Seite el fühlet die Luft. One can hear the four voices declaim this in this meter. And this is particularly true because of the poetic meter of the first text. It's dactylic, 
long, short, short, long, short, short in its organization. And that in turn clearly suggests the dance-like triple meter that Bach chooses for this movement. The last aria too, Bluet ihr Linden in Sachsen Gitteren, same poetic and same musical meter and the same dance character and Bach even cast this movement with an organization just like a dance piece. Now the other movements of this cantata are not in this same poetic meter, but Bach nonetheless chooses triple meter for two of the three solo arias, meaning that all but one of the non-recitative movements in this work are in triple meter, and that contributes to the festive character of the cantata. In the final aria, there's a characteristic line from each of the mythological figures. Fama introduces the call of long live the queen. Pallas Athena calls on the muses to sing, and Bologna, of course, wants the noise of weapons. Irene begins this final chorus, and what she says is telling. In her first recitative, she speaks of her olive tree. That's a classicizing reference, but of course, it's also scriptural, referring to the olive branch of the Noah story. She is, after all, the goddess of peace. And in the final chorus, she refers once again to a tree, blossom you lindens in Saxony. The linden tree represents Leipzig, whose name means the place where lindens grow. But notice also that she says, may they blossom like cedars. Once again, that's scriptural, that's from Psalm 92, the righteous will flourish like a cedar in Lebanon that claims biblical righteousness for Leipzig. Now, pieces like this homage cantata usually invoked God as protector, as the source of royal authority, especially at the end of a work. But of course, that was a delicate matter here in the arch-Lutheran Leipzig town honoring the Catholic electress. The issue is mostly sidestepped in favor of invocations of rejoicing and in the sound of music and praise at every turn. That made for a good evening at Zimmermann's and a safe presentation to the Queen.
so dringe in das weite Herdenrund, mein von der Königin erfüllter Mund. Ihr Ruhm soll bis zum Achsen des schön gestirnten Himmels wachsen. Der Königin der Sachsen und der Polen sei stets des Himmelsschutz empfohlen. So stärkt durch sie der Pol, so viele Untertanen längst der Wünschtes Wohl. So soll die Königin noch lange bei uns hier verweilen. Und spät, ach spät zum Sternen eilen. Thank uh-huh. you.